Well, thank you, everyone, for coming back. Uh, that was great fun, the previous panel. It's a hard act to follow. And um, not only that, but um, being uh, speaking on the last panel, last session of this conference, also means that um, I already have this. Uh, this is just for the microphone. You want slides, right? Oh, yes, I do. Thank OK. The big green one. The big OK. Um, it also means that the slides I prepared, uh, some of them I will probably not spend too much time on because so much has already been discussed uh, and thought about together at this, uh, at this wonderful event, which um, is really an opportunity for um, this bridging exercise that I think was behind uh, the intention of the organizers to bring together uh, people for very different segments of this field, uh, researchers, practitioners, uh, people who um, have been involved in integration for a very long time, uh, some of us who have been uh, studying mostly uh, or working on um, more traditional so-called historic minorities, um, but also uh, expanding our research agendas to include other uh, newer minority groups. Um, my own work um, has been primarily on uh, traditional uh, minorities that have learned how to be minorities uh, because they have been political minorities for generations. And uh, since about 2009, I have also started um, studying as a comparativist, uh, political scientist who studies state minority relations from a comparative perspective to also study uh, Russians and Russophones in the three Baltic states and also Poles in Lithuania. And um, in, my, in the current project uh, I'm working on, which uh, is also a monograph I'm writing, I'm working with uh, Cornell University Press on this monograph in which um, I decided to, I gave myself this very ambitious um, question of uh, answering the question of what makes some minorities uh, more resourceful than others, in a sense going out a little bit on a limb by using uh, the term resilient minorities, which in many contexts um, is a scary term. Because uh, especially in the context of uh, nation state building and nation state models and states that are created, especially in this region, but also outside of this region, that are uh, created on the model of, of majoritarian, unitary, uh, centralized nation states. The idea of resilient minorities is not uh, necessarily an easy one to think about. The way I approach this, however, having studied state minority relations for quite a while, is that, um, first of all, societies themselves need to be resilient. Social resilience is a good thing. And uh, in the last uh, few years, we have actually learned, uh, some of us in a harder way, living in uh, the neighborhood of uh, Trumpism. I live in Canada, but I'm also a US citizen, lived in, in the US in the Washington DC area for 20 years. And we learned how important it is for societies to be resilient to, um, among other things, to uh, political elite attempts to capture institutions. And those of us who also study Central Europe have also seen the, the rise of so-called illiberal, illiberal democracy in Hungary and Poland. Um, signs of it are emerging also in other parts of the region. And so all of this is reminding us, and I hope not only those of us who are studying these uh, phenomena, but also those who are just following the news, that um, 
social resilience is a value, is something that needs to be worked on continuously. And so that took me uh, in the direction of looking at institutions in between state institutions and individuals, intermediary institutions as sources of social resilience, which obviously is not a new discovery. There is a very long tradition in democratization uh, scholarship focused on civil society institutions. And um, this tradition goes back to, I put a few names up there to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who first wrote about the significance of social institutions in maintaining uh, democracy. Uh, then in the 1960s, uh, the first comparative study was published, I think, in 63 by uh, Gabriel Alman and uh, Sidney Verba, in which they made a groundbreaking effort to actually find out what the ingredients of this culture, of this democratic civil society political culture might be. And they titled it Civic Culture. And uh, what they did was, uh, this is, of course, part of the behavioralist uh, um, paradigm in the social sciences when the idea is that if you do well enough to find out through surveys about how people feel, what they know about the, their government, uh, what their attitude, political attitude is, and also about, um, about their behavior, whether they are likely to vote or not, in which way, and you put all of this together, you get a profile of a person as a political actor. And uh, so these people got enough money from the US government to conduct this major, at the time really groundbreaking, study that included the US, the UK, um, Germany, Italy, and Mexico. And they came up with what they thought was the profile of a civic person who had civic culture. And guess where this, people, this person lived? in the US. So uh, obviously, this groundbreaking work became also highly controversial, <laughs> called ethnocentric for a good reason, because uh, they found the person they were looking for at home. They also found that, and this is going to surprise you as well, that the farther away you go from home, the less of the home you find. So they found that societies that were closer and more similar to theirs were also civic and others were not. Okay, so this nonetheless, despite all of these issues, became a model for other comparativist minded people like myself to go out and try to do something comparatively to find ingredients of this stuff that goes on between state and individuals and families. Now the next person who became um, famous, highly influential, uh, was Robert Putnam, who uh, wrote a book, and you'll be surprised to find that he titled it Making Democracy Work, because all of this quest for what's that stuff in between that makes the stuff of civil society um, is in the framework of people being interested in what makes democracy work, right? What is it that makes some people populate the same formal institutions differently than others? So people found that it's not enough to go out and, and, and create the formal institutions of a government, maybe copy someone's constitution or build certain electoral systems, but that people have to actually move into those rooms and start using them and living in them in ways that make sense for them. And so Putnam, uh, the term that he used for this stuff is uh, social capital. And uh, of course, he didn't uh, coin the term. He borrowed it from someone else, Coleman, but that's OK. He made it more f uh, famous, and he made it work. Because what he said, and he, he, he made us think about the significance of reciprocity and mutuality, and said that social capital, the most significant matter of social capital is what he calls horizontal. Uh, reciprocity and trust. 
again, if you think about it, so much of what has been talked about and thought about uh, in this, uh, um, at this conference so far does have to do with this question of mutuality and reciprocity and trust. And so clearly, what Putnam said in 1993 uh, has resonance, resonance and, and, and significance today. Um, but the part of the literature that I tie to the way I am thinking of, of, of this stuff in between as intermediary institutions is democratization literature, especially the studies that are coming from Latin Americanists. Latin American scholars who studied processes of democratization and particularly issues of undemocratization. Situations when a democracy uh, uh, is created, it's used for a little while and then, it, then it's hijacked through typically a military coup or some other way. And so people like uh, O'Donnell, Guillermo O'Donnell, for example, a very significant, highly influential uh, Latin American scholar said precisely this, that we need intermediary institutions because they make societies resilient. And otherwise, democracy is only about the act of voting for some representatives and then people go home and then between elections nothing happens and he used the term of delegative democracy for that. And he said, it's not good enough. It's not good enough, it, it makes people vulnerable. Uh, social groups are vulnerable. And um, Snyder, I put up there as well, Jack Snyder, because he linked institutions, these intermediary institutions also to conflict, ethnic conflict. He wrote a book that came out in 2000, which is titled From uh, Voting to Violence. He's an international relations scholar, another very influential scholar at Columbia University. And the title indicates From Voting to Violence, again, that you know, first act of democratization usually is free elections, right? You go to vote, but then how come? Uh, in societies where there is so much interest and desire for democracy, then it turns to violent conflict. And he gives a somewhat more complicated answer, of course, but what I'm going to highlight from that for, for, this, for this purpose is he emphasizes the significance of those intermediary institutions. So he says that in societies where even though the previous system was non-democratic, obviously that's why they needed to change to democracy, even though there was an autocracy, some kind of authoritarian system there, if there were social institutions, networks, that grounded people, in which people were able to live a social life that, that, that made them not just vulnerable atoms and specks out there, but, but institutions that, that provided some kind of security a uh, source of information sharing, of deliberation, also as, as places where um, potential democratically then electable elites are socialized and can emerge, those kinds of societies and associations, in those cases there is less of a chance that after democracy, the first act of democracy in elections take place, that uh, because of, you know, everything can now be discussed and come to the surface, violence might emerge, but in those societies there's less of a chance that violence is going to follow in ethnically diverse, divided societies. Now, as I said, all of that is somewhat traditional scholarship in, in, in this field, in political science, but it has great relevance today if you think about it because we have so many um, well, pieces of evidence that democracy is fragile, not only in new democracies but also in long-standing democracies, right? And that people do need institutions to ground them and to use for the social, I don't know, acts 
and uh, processes and uh, interactions and exchanges that make them less vulnerable to undemocratization, to manipulation by their own political elites or external, external forces. Um, so resilient societies. And in Europe, if you think about it, there have been some recent significant external shocks or internal, depending on how you look at it, the Euro crisis, right? Uh, then uh, the refugee crisis. So there, these can be considered external shocks that test the resilience of societies. It also tests uh, the integrity of political elites, but what we know about political elites and leaders is no offense to those who were sitting here just a few minutes ago or anyone else in the room. Um, political leaders actually are probably, in most cases, pretty short-sighted. They are very likely to use nationalism because nationalism is a really low-hanging fruit. It's easy to use to mobilize. And uh, because of that, those can be shocks that make society less resilient. And so what is the place of minority intermediary institutions in all of this? And again, as I said, I'm using intermediary institutions as a, as a term, as an aggregate uh, term to capture these uh, organizations that in the literature is usually um, called civil society or non-governmental sector or sometimes even social economies used in various segments of, of, of the literature. I use intermediary institutions in my work and this is something that you can tell me I should change because I just decided about this two months ago, I think, is that I'd like to highlight the significance of them also as mediating, as bridging, not only between state and government organizations and individuals and families, but also in multi-ethnic societies, and all societies are multi-ethnic to some degree, right? Also bridging between cultures and among cultures. And this, by the way, this aspect of this intermediary segment of institutions is not studied. There is really surprisingly little comparative research about it. There are some ethnographies about this case or another case, but there's a glaring gap in the literature about this, which if you think about it is actually surprising. I mean, knowing how important and how divisive ethnic conflict and division can be, knowing how important intermediary institutions can be, how come there's so little research about it? especially comparative research. So the reason why we have to do better, we have to do better, researchers obviously, but I think every, practitioners as well, uh, to look at this and think, think of them in terms of bridging intermediate organizations and not just those, you know, um, foundations where 15 people are sipping coffee and uh, thinking about what grant to apply for next time for the next three years project, which will then end after three years and might not continue afterwards. But, but, but as, as being part of this stuff in between where they can be doing more to turn society more resilient, minority resilience is significant, it's really part of it. And I'm hoping that, you know, there was a subtext here um, under many of the talks and discussions that, that minorities of various kinds need to be thought of as democratic partners. Because if we get stuck in this mind frame of thinking of minorities as Trojan horses forever, <laughs> um, then, then trust, remember that thing that, that we are looking for, cohesion, social solidarity, is not gonna happen. And especially when there are shocks, internal, external shocks. That's why we need to make minority intermediary institutions also part of this structure of intermediary institutions. 
And so that's why there is a significant place for them, because otherwise there are dangers of minority alienation, losing a voice, exit from institutions, right? And one of, uh, at least one of the speakers earlier, this morning there was a wonderful panel um, about how art can, uh, can and is used in, in large cities, multi-ethnic, multicultural cities on, um, you know, in everyday life for, for this kind of bridging exercise. Uh, there was one comment about how uh, it's very important to, to do those, to support, fund those kinds of activities because what happens otherwise is radicalization and minority members or those who feel marginalized, alienated, sometimes even vilified if they're seen as Trojan horses, members of a Trojan horse population, then they are going to look for extra institutional modes of uh, political action. That's why you need institutionalized modes of contestation. And it's okay to have contestation. Conflict is not something that needs to be eliminated in democracy. Actually, democracy, as opposed to autocracy and dictatorship says, conflict is okay, we just have to channel it. We have to channel it into institutions. And so, so that's why, oopsie, we need those institutions. Now, um, how much time do I have? No time left, okay. All right, so there is a lot of comparative research to support this thing, and one of them says that uh, a, a very significant comparative study shows that majorities are not going to, on their own, provide a lot of resources for minorities because when push comes to shove, especially when there are economic problems. There's this thing that one scholar calls selective solidarity, Edward Koning is the name, um, which means that even in the wealthiest welfare societies, majority members are going to want to maintain welfare and solidarity for their kin. And so state action matters. State action doesn't mean top-down creation of civil society, co-optation of civil society, but it means partnerships. It means that you know, we have the luxury in Europe, or you do, of having the European Union and NATO, but the state has to be involved in providing, enabling institutions, economic institutions, and those are the intermediary institutions, and they are run by those intermediary elites that have to do all of that coordination. It's a tall order to do all of this. But we need those institutions and the states and local governments have to be involved. And I'm sorry about over. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, it was actually <laughs> the, the, the extra time. three minutes that I gave you was part of your birthday gift. Oh, thank you. So uh, <laughs> she has a birthday today. 